Yeah, you're here because she cut off his d Remember Lorena Bobbitt, the woman who cut off her husband's male member in 1993? I always thought that her story was one of a kind. Unfortunately for Frank Baronda, it wasn't. For on May 30th, 1907, Frank would lose his Frank. Let's get into it. But first, if you like these videos about the most scandalous people from yesteryear who make Ty's Hot Mess History a time capsule for the culture, subscribe and hit the notification bell so that you can know every time that I upload content. And please hit that like button to support this video for free. Thank you. Now on to why you are here. In 1890, right around Christmas time, Frank Baronda met Serena. And just a couple of years later, they were the talk of the town for all of the wrong reasons. And it's not because she chopped his penis off. It was because she tried to end her life by drinking chloroform. Why? Because Frank was beating her. Serena had brought a daughter from a previous relationship into her marriage with Frank. And eventually, he went from beating her to abandoning her and his stepdaughter. Then, in 1895, the couple was granted a divorce. But that was Serena. Bertha was the one who chopped off his wang. She was his second wife, and he married her on Christmas Day, 1901. Something about this man and a Christmas wedding. Maybe he felt like his precious bride was the gift that he received on Christmas. Well, he certainly wouldn't feel that way about Bertha by the time their marriage was over. Bertha was born Bertha Settle to German immigrant parents in 1877. When she and Frank were married in 1901, she was 24 years old. Frank Baranda came from a rather upstanding family in California's Bay Area. His family members made headlines for all of the right reasons, and Frank made headlines for all of the wrong reasons. His great-great-grandfather was one of the first teachers in the San Francisco area. And Frank, by the time of our story, was the fire captain of San Jose. And also, just a few months before the wiener whacking, Frank had made the news. The February 11, 1907 edition of the Daily Palo Alto Times reported that he had been arrested and jailed for election fraud. None of his relatives were allowed to visit him in jail. And even after his eventual release, he wouldn't be done with those charges, and he was worried about it. Well, fast forward to May 29, 1907, Frank would have more pressing issues on his mind. It was a Wednesday night, and he took his wife, Bertha, to the theater for a date. That sounds like a nice gesture, and can make someone wonder why he was missing his meat puppet just hours later. But this date wasn't just any date. That night at the theater, Frank let Bertha know that he was pretty sure that he was going to be rearrested for buying votes in his election fraud case. So, he was likely opening up to Bertha in an attempt to put everything out in the open before he went away. And he might have been trying to show her a little romance so that she would give him some lovin' before he went away to prison where he couldn't get any lovin'. At least not from women. But whatever his reason or reasons were for this date night, certainly took Bertha by surprise because for the two weeks leading up to this date, Frank hadn't spoken to her at all. And that wasn't really unusual in their marriage, but I'll give you those details later. I'll tell you the rest of what happened on May 29th and in the wee hours of May 30th that led a jury to believe that Bertha snapped, then she snipped. After the theater, Frank and Bertha went home. In tears, she asked Frank if he still loved her. Seems understandable after two weeks of silent treatment, then being blindsided with the knowledge that he's going away to prison. Well, he swore to her that he did love her, and then he asked her for sex. Briefly skipping ahead to the trial, it does appear that Bertha granted his request to engage in intercourse with Frank because he testified that she was amorous that night. It's just not 100% clear because publications didn't discuss things of a sexual nature in blatant terms in those times. But what is clear is that some point after Frank fell asleep, apparently shortly after midnight, Bertha got up and found Frank's straight razor, and whilst he was sleeping, she ever so quietly and gently got back into bed with him and took it upon herself to slice off his phallus. What she did after that, again, is unclear. 
Some sources say that she immediately ran off into the night. Another source says that she woke up a nephew who was staying with them to tell him Frank cut himself. I don't doubt that some details were added to make this salacious story even more salacious in order to sell newspapers, but I have no doubt whatsoever about what Frank did and said after she cut him. According to all of the records, he said, He jumped up and screamed hysterically at the top of his lungs. Now remember, Frank was the fire captain of San Jose. Well, it just so happened that their house was right next to the fire station. I can only imagine how grateful he was in that moment to have help so near. While his fellow firefighters were in their lounge on standby for the next emergency, it would come to them, but not in the form of a fire. They got the shock of their lives when their captain burst through the door, bleeding from the lower half of his body and screaming at the top of his lungs. After they discovered the source of his bleeding, they rushed Frank to the nearest Red Cross hospital where he received the medical attention he desperately needed. Meanwhile, exactly what Bertha did next is unclear. At least the timeline is. The Santa Cruz Sentinel on June 2, 1907, reported that she rushed into the streets in her own night clothes, then in another location, procured men's clothes and put them on. It went on to say that she was captured several hours later. Now, she was definitely captured wearing men's clothes, but other sources say that she dressed herself in them before she left her house to run away. And that's what I believe is true based on something that came out in her testimony during the trial, and I'll get there. Another thing that is unclear is exactly how long she was on the run. Some sources say that it was just a few hours, and from there it ranges up to as long as just over 24 hours. But here's what happened during and after her capture. When she was caught, she was still dressed like a man. She was mounting a bicycle that she was planning to use as her means of escape. But the police found her, arrested her, and locked her up in the San Jose City Jail. When she woke up in jail the next morning and an officer questioned her about what she had done, she told him that she had no memory of the incident. Well, Frank remembered, and two days after the horrifying incident, he swore to his formal complaint against his wife while still in the hospital bed, and Bertha Baranda was charged with the crime of mayhem. Now, that whole scene sounds like what we would call mayhem, but that was the specific charge. Here's how their state court system defined mayhem in 1907, according to that Santa Cruz Sentinel article. Quote, Every person who unlawfully and maliciously deprives a human being of a member of his body, or renders it useless, or cuts or disables the tongue, or puts out an eye, or slits the tongue, nose, ear, or lip, is guilty of mayhem. End quote. This was a crime that was punishable by up to 14 years in prison. After further questioning at the city jail, Bertha revealed that she sliced his sausage because she was convinced that Frank was going to leave her, desert her and move to Mexico without telling her. Oh, and one more thing she said, she wasn't sorry. That brings us to the trial. There was a judge and a jury. The jury was made up of 12 men. And here's what they learned. It seemed like Bertha had been just about as happy in her marriage as Frank's first wife. Remember, the one who tried to end her own life? Just a little more than a year into the marriage, Bertha suspected that Frank was cheating on her. After learning that her suspicions were correct, she and Frank separated for half a year. During that time, Frank would write letters to Bertha, begging her to take him back. Eventually, she gave in. But after she took him back, his cheating didn't stop. The situation worsened, and he would leave her alone for weeks at a time. But it stands to reason that the woman or women with whom he was cheating must have been local gals. Because Bertha was staying at their house, which you recall was right next door to the fire station where Frank worked. Well, Frank was still reporting to work, and clearly Bertha could see him, because in her really desperate moments, she would just take a few short steps next door to his job. 
and she would beg Frank to just talk to her. He would ignore her in front of everyone. But there was more. This part explains why I believe that right after she slit his salami, she dressed herself in the men's clothes she was wearing when the police captured her, as opposed to leaving the house, then putting on the clothes after she ran. In court, she admitted to wearing some clothes that belonged to her brother. She'd wear them as a disguise on a regular basis, then follow her husband after he got off from work to see where he was going, who he was seeing besides her. She told the court that she suspected that she had been getting no more than two hours of sleep every night for quite a while. And I should mention that she also worked a full-time job. So it's not like she got to sleep all day once she knew that Frank was clocked in at work and likely not able to cheat on her in those hours. And being deprived of sleep to that extent can make a person feel insane. And that, by the way, was her defense on record. Emotional insanity. Which would have been driven by jealousy from his cheating and her fear that he would abandon her. Bertha went on to testify that she found multiple love letters from other women that Frank had been keeping. They were all romantic and sexual. And one of them was from Lillian Doan. She was the daughter of his first wife, the one who became the talk of the town after drinking chloroform in order to end her life. And yes, it appeared that he was talking to her in a romantic nature as well, his former stepdaughter. A number of witnesses testified that they knew about Frank's cheating, and they knew what Bertha said she would do about it. She told multiple people that if she caught him cheating again, she would do something violent to him. One witness said that Bertha's exact words were, I'll blow his head off. Well, it was a cut. And the wrong head. But I think that she made her point. Frank's only testimony was, Hey, I don't have a dick. And at the end of the day, that was the main thing that mattered. Bertha had admitted to doing it. The jury would have to decide if her defense was enough to acquit her or not. The jury was made up of 12 men. So we're talking about 12 men making a judgment on a crime against a Jimmy. And the way that I have seen men fold over at the mere sight of another man being kicked in his nether regions, I wouldn't have been surprised to learn that this jury took four minutes to find Bertha guilty and request the death penalty for her. But... That's not exactly how it happened. The jury deliberated for a couple of hours before returning to court with a verdict. Guilty. Those 12 men were not going to let this case end in a hung jury. That would have made Frank feel bad. Because, you know, hung. Oh, never mind. Sentencing was left up to the judge. She was facing up to 14 years. But she was sentenced to only five years in San Quentin prison. This 1908 edition of the California shows a good example of how newspapers wrote about Bertha's crime. It was vaguely referred to as the crime of mayhem, unspeakable mutilation, unthinkable mayhem. It was the early 1900s, and the papers didn't make a habit of printing about private body parts, at least not to call them out by name. But while the newspapers never said specifically that Frank was missing a wee-wee, her booking documents made it very clear that Bertha hadn't been charged for mayhem for slicing off an ear. And it appears that her mug shots display a slight grin of satisfaction. Maybe that's just how I see it. Let me know what you think about it and this entire case in the comment section. Bertha was a model prisoner and ended up being paroled on good behavior, serving only two and a half years of her five-year sentence. Frank filed for divorce. Eventually, not until 1923, and on the grounds of having been sliced and deserted by his wife. His divorce was, of course, granted. Now, surprisingly enough, Bertha married again. Yes, some man out there was brave enough to take that chance. I can only imagine that he did everything in his power to keep her happy, and probably slept with one eye open. But... She got married to her second husband in 1921, two years before Frank filed for divorce. So she was also a bigamist. 
even with that, their marriage ended in divorce too. But he got to leave with all of his body parts. And Frank Baranda married for a third time. He did not go on to have any children with his third wife, and that's probably not a surprise. American jazz legend Duke Ellington is another man who knows something about taking a slashing from his wife. Thankfully for him, it wasn't below the belt. If you want to know why his wife slashed his face, then check out this video. I'll leave a link to it in the description box. My sources for this story are the Daily Palo Alto Times Archives 1907, Morbid Knowledge on X, The Ghastly Tale of Bertha Baranda, The Bay Area's Lorena Bobbitt by Katie Dowd for SF Gate, Santa Cruz Sentinel Archives 1907, and The Californian Archives 1908. This video has been brought to you by me. Well, my Patreon is a sponsor for this video. If you like these dirty scandals on my channel, then you'll love my Patreon, Ty's Too Hot Hot Mess History. It has all of the stuff that I can't talk about or show here because it's just too hot, too violent, too sexual, too graphic, too much. Come and join us there for the hot, hot mess history. The link is in the description box.